Thank you very much. Okay, so an introduction to building your own digital audio effects. And there's a variety of projects of mine. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of different things um, that, I've, that I've made so far. But um, just, just to start off, I'll just talk very briefly about me. Uh, I'm Scott Bickethley. Uh, I write music, make instruments, um, play live under the name Cutlasses. So I'm a programmer with no electronics background. In fact, I was thinking about it today. I think I got an E in AS level electronics and for years thought, okay, I can't do electronics. Um, I'm also terrible at DIY, I can't put up a shelf, um, I'm no good at that stuff. So what I really want to get across in this talk is that if I can do this stuff, then you almost certainly can too. So why would we want to make our own things rather than buy things? Well, it's almost certainly not going to save you any money. Um, yeah, it's not saved me any money, that's for sure. Um, but you do get to make something completely unique. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a lot of people using the same plugins, the same audio samples, but no one's going to have the piece of hardware that you designed and built, unless you give it to them. But also you get to make stuff, and I'm guessing that most of us here like to make stuff, and you know, that's a big part of it for me. I want to I build things, and um, that's a lot of why I do it. So I think we're experiencing a bit of renaissance um, in musical hardware at the moment. Uh, there's lots of small manufacturers uh, doing really interesting things, um, very experimental things, things that wouldn't work mass market, but things that sound very individual and very um, interesting. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the barrier to entry is lower than it's ever been before. And I think partly that's because uh, microcontrollers are cheaper, if you can get hold of them. Um, development boards are cheaper. Uh, and you can get PCBs uh, made in very small numbers, um, which wasn't the case you know, a decade ago. So what I'm going to talk about is how you can get started making your own audio hardware. I'm going to outline the processes a bit involved in building, building some hardware. Look at some hardware building blocks and how you can treat them a bit like Lego and not necessarily need to understand exactly how they work. What I'm not going to go into is any specifics of DSP because there's other people that can teach you that a lot better than I can. Uh, lots of great books on it. I'm not going to go into any code really um, or anything in any great detail because we don't have very much time. Um, so we've only got half an hour. So it's going to be very high level, but hopefully uh, I can just give you the inspiration to go and look more. You can check out the stuff that I'm doing, check out all the people that are doing great stuff and get started basically. So anatomy of a hardware digital effect. What is a digital effect? Well, I'm talking about anything from guitar pedals, uh, Euro rack modules, um, rack, mounted units. They're all essentially the same thing. Um, they import audio um, from the analog domain into digital. They have some kind of uh, microprocessor, microcontroller inside them that processes that audio, does something with them, an effect, be it delay, reverb, or some completely new effect. And then they spit it back out as audio again. And that's really all they're doing. So how do we get audio um, from the analog domain, a voltage in a, in a wire, to um, something that we can process in digital? Well, we have to do um, something called analog to digital conversion. So we have an ADC and a DAC. So the ADC is an analog to digital converter, and the DAC is a digital to analog converter. So they're like the two core bits that sit either end of what we're doing. Um, we get the, uh, the analog signal into digital by a process called sampling, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, and you can see that image up there. We've got some arbitrary waveform, and we're sampling it at regular rates. We're taking the voltage or the, the amplitude of the signal at that point, and we're converting it into a digital number. So the, the, the frequency at which we take those samples is the sample rate in hertz, and how much space we allocate for each sample um, is the bit depth. So it might be 16-bit, 12-bit, 24-bit, but that's the, de the depth. So if you think about a CD, that's 44.1 kilohertz and 16-bit samples. CDs sound good, so you know, there's no need to go much higher than that. Some, a lot of things work at 24-bit nowadays, but um, again, if you're starting off, CD quality is 
been good enough for most people for a long time. Also, the, the more frequent your sampling and the larger your samples, uh, the more memory you need to deal with them. So that's a, a, a consideration. So here's a really simple breakdown of what uh, digital effects doing. You've got some analog audio coming in to your um, ADC, or analog to digital converter. It's going into your microcontroller. Uh, we've got some additional hardware that the microcontroller is also going to read, be it switches or encoders or potentiometers or whatever it is that parameterize your effect in some way. Um, if you're doing Eurorack, you might also have CV coming in that you need to um, deal with. And then we're doing our process, whatever that is. Um, as I say, it might be your reverb, your delay, whatever. And then we've got to spit it back out again as, as, um, as analog. So we have to go from digital to analog. And that's really what every hardware effect is doing, essentially. So how do we get started making them? Well, you can go the entire um, like from scratch route. Um, so build everything yourself, assemble your own PCBs, build your own, you know, connect everything up, um, which is what I did with one of my modules, the SANS module, um, which you can read about if you're interested. But um, I wouldn't advise starting like that. Um, it's much easier to start out with a development board. So here I'm going to talk about Teensy and Daisy as two kind of good options. Uh, how many people here know what Arduino is? Right, so the vast majority of people. So Teensy and Daisy, very similar idea. It's just a, a development board. You've got your microcontroller and a bunch of hardware to um, allow you to interface with um, the outside world. Once you've got your design using a development board, then you, if you want to, you can go that bit further and you can uh, eventually get rid of the development board and build it all from scratch. Um, and that's obviously if you want to build hundreds of them and sell them, then that's, that's probably what you would do. So the other option is you could use a Linux-based board, say Raspberry Pi. Um, that's what Norns uses, which is quite a um, popular audio processor or, or sound computer. Uh, there's Beagle Bone Black, um, which Bella uses. Um, but in my mind, these are a bit heavyweight for doing simple effects. You don't really want a whole operating system just so that you can um, edit some audio live because, A, it's um, a lot of hardware um, that you're paying for. And you know if you want to build many of them, it's going to be a problem. But also, you've got an inbuilt latency just from the fact that you're using an operating system. Um, I'm not very experienced at using um, Linux-based boards, so um, I can't you know, go much more into than that. But, but what I want to talk about is, is using these kind of bare-to-the-metal um, development boards. So first of all, we're going to talk about Teensy, which comes from a company called PJRC. So that has a, an ADC and a DAC built in, so we can do lo-fi audio with it. They're not audio components, so they're not designed to do audio, but to get you started, uh, absolutely fine. Um, they're quite noisy, um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're fine. The audio library is really well documented. They've been making these for years and years. Um, they're really stable, really, really, uh, really good bits of hardware. And so the, it's the Teensy at the bottom, but just above it is the audio shield. So if you do want high quality audio, that has what's called an audio codec on, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, and that will give you a high quality audio. It also has an SD card reader in it. And you can program that through the Arduino IDE, which is great to get started, although not necessarily so great if you want to do a really big project. Um, but yeah, it's just really well supported. And you can buy the Teensy 3.2 and the Audio Shield for about £35. So not super expensive to get going. And one of the things that's really nice about the Teensy environment is that they have their own web-based design tool. So you can go onto their web page, you can arrange their inbuilt um, effects, make a little signal chain, export it uh, to C++, um, and then you can just compile it and go. And so once you've wired it up, you don't have to do any more programming than that, and you've got a digital effect. So great to get started. Probably not what you'd... I don't tend to use it now, but it's a, it's a really nice way of getting started. And so this is what the pinout would look like. So you buy your Teensy. This is a Teensy 3.5, I think, um, or 3.6. They look, they look the same. Um, but you can see on that board um, 
in A22 and A21 are your DACs, so that's where you'd be getting your um, audio out because you're going digital to analog. And then any of the pins that are grey are the analog pins, so you can get your ADC and you can convert from analog to digital. And then you've got audio in and out. So that was Taint C, very briefly. And the other one uh, I wanted to, to mention is uh, the Daisy, the Seed from Electra Smith. Um, it's audio capable with high quality audio right off the bat. Uh, it's got a fully featured audio library, much like the Teensy one. You can program it through the Arduino IDE, but also uh, you can program it through uh, the a C++ toolchain using Visual Studio Code or Eclipse or whatever you want to use. It's very new, well, relatively new compared to the Teensy. It's a couple of years old now, but um, the documentation is not as um, fully fleshed out. But they're not expensive. They're about thirty pounds if you can get them. I couldn't find anywhere that had them, but actually, Elevator Sounds in Bristol ordered me some in, which is really good because you can get them imported from US, but then obviously you need to pay import tax and whatever. So they, they've got them for me. So yeah, Elevator Sounds should have probably written this on here, but yeah, that's. Um, a good tip if you want to get some because it's, they're quite hard to find. So again, there's there's the pin out. That's that's showing you what to, what you want to, to connect connect to. And you see here, if you look at pins 19 to 16, uh, you'll see there's like dedicated audio. So rather than using the standard built-in ADC and DAC, you're using the high-quality audio. And all the other like A0 and D15, they're your analog and digital input. So that's what you're going to connect your other peripherals to, your other components to. So just as a very quick comparison, I would say Teensy is arguably a little bit easier to get started with. Um, it's got that nice graphical tool to, to build something really simple. Daisy has a lot of RAM, like an insane amount of RAM for a microcontroller, like 64 megabytes. It may not sound very much if you're working with a PC or with a phone, but um, it's, an, it's a lot for uh, a microcontroller development board. And it's, so it's really useful for doing audio where you can just have huge buffers to do interesting things. But saying that, a lot of my early projects were based on the fact that I had very small buffers in the Teensy, so I only had 64K, and so I had to do something that was based around a very small amount of RAM. So I came up with this audio freeze, and I wouldn't have done that if I'd have had more memory. So sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes limitations are good. Uh, the DAISY also uh, is m uh, easy to debug. You can um, use an STM programmer rather than doing it over USB, and then you can, you've got full um, JTAG debugging, which is really useful. I spent, I don't know how many weekends tearing my hair out with a Teensy, trying to get some audio bugs sorted um, by just looking at audio, by looking at serial output. And when you're running at audio rate 44,000 times a second, you've got so much serial output, you don't have to like scroll through it. And just being able to put a breakpoint in literally saves you days. Um, and at some points, I was like, why am I doing this? I'm not having fun. I'm really stressed out. And this is like my limited hobby time. So. Um, yeah, debugging is, is useful. And I think Daisy is probably a better path to manufacture if you want to go and make loads of them because Teensy has some bespoke components that you need to buy from them if you want to go straight from using their development. But I think which either one you use, it's all really good training to, 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 to you know, if you wanted to then go ahead and build something from scratch. So really quickly, I'm not going to go into this table really, but it's just to show you the difference in, in capabilities. So you'll see the, uh, the, the Linux-based ones, the two at the top, have loads of uh, memory, really fast processors, but they're more expensive. And the Teensy, you can see, only has 64K, the Teensy 3.1. But it's still, that's fine if you want to do a delay or a reverb, that's enough. So also, you can use uh, SD cards. Um, if, you, if you want to get around the fact you've got limited memory, you might think, oh, SD cards, I've got gigabytes of memory. And that means you can hold hours and hours of audio. And you can write to it and read to it in real time. The quality of the card is super important. If you buy a cheap card, um, and sometimes it's not even that easy to tell if you're getting like a, a rebranded card or not. Um, the quality is generally not good. But even on the high quality cards, uh, you can get really inconsistent read times. So you need really large buffers. Um, I did a, I've, I've written a looper for users an SD card. 
and 99% of the time works fine. Every so often, I'll get a read or a write on the SD card that takes a second of time. None of my buffers are big enough to hold a second of audio, and you get a glitch, and there's just nothing I've found to do about that. So, and also, they work better if you're using linear access patterns. So a looper is a good example. If you're just looping something around, fine. If you want to do something more glitchy, a bit more experimental, and you want to jump around in that memory, SD cards are not going to be good for that because your buffering is, unless you've got some very clever buffering. So that's how, that's kind of a very quick summary of, of the dev board situation. So I just want to do a lightning kind of tour of how you might go f um, and what you might do with a dev board. So you've bought your dev board. This is a Teensy 3.2. We've got some, sorry, not breadboard, you bought your development board. You plugged it into your breadboard. Here it is hooked up to power uh, or hooking the power up to the, to the lines. And I just wanted to show you some of the really simple building blocks that you, you, you need. So you don't need to understand any complicated circuits. Um, this is just your audio in and your audio out. So you've got this little jack connector, which is called a ThonkyCon connector, made by, um, well, sold by a company called Thonk, who do loads of uh, Eurorack style kits. Um, it has a ground pin and a signal pin. Um, the other pin is kind of a switch, I won't bother going into that, but essentially you've got a ground and a signal. And all you need to do, uh, the very simplest way to get your audio in, is to, is to hook your ground up to your ground line and to hit your, your signal or the tip of the um, connector up to your pin that's doing the audio, and away you go. That's, that's it, you've got audio. You might want to get a potentiometer in there. So a potentiometer is just like a dial. Uh, you know, you might want to set your reverb time, your delay time, whatever it is you're parameterizing. Um, that's, that's all you need to do it. You, you would set your potentiometer up like a, a voltage divider. So on one side you've got power, on the other side you've got ground, and your wiper's just going to one of your um, analog pins, and you're just reading that um, voltage as it gets split, and it will go from um, power at one end to ground the other end, so, so you're going to get like maximum to minimum as you turn your dial, and you can use that to scale and apply to whatever you want in your code. And that's, you know, that's simple. Uh, it's a simple layout. You might have 10 of them, so it might look complicated on a schematic, but they're all doing that exact same thing. And same with switches. You would tie one end of your switch to ground, the other end of your switch to a digital pin, and then you can just read when that switch is closed and open. Now, when it's open, it's going to be floating, so you'd want to pull it up um, to power to your power line, and so you would do that with a pull-up resistor, but actually it's generally even easier than that because most microcontrollers have pull-up resistors built in. So you just configure that in the code. So there's a really simple breadboard example that I did in a workshop um, a while ago, and it's just a Teensy with a little button that you can press that plays a built-in sample and runs it through some effects that you can set up and some potentiometers to, to parameterize the effect. Like those components, you know, are a few pounds, um, and you can build something really quickly and do loads of experimenting just just with that really simple setup. So once you've got those simple building blocks, you're going to need. You know, I'm not saying that, that that that's as simple as it is. It gets more complicated the more you get into it. But uh, I just want to get across that you can get started really quickly. Um, but you, you know, you might want to deal with external power. You're probably going to want to do some kind of gain staging, attenuation, depending on what your different levels are coming in. Op amps are super useful for that, so you know you can look at non-inverting or inverting op amps to do those things. But you know it's all a, a gradual development, right? You don't start with those things. You start with getting something working and getting that reward and going, okay, I, that worked. Because that's how it works for me. I find if there's too many things, I, like, I don't understand it. I'm not going to try. But if I can get something simple working and see it working, I'm like, okay, I get that now, and I can move on to the next thing. So yeah, you might add up, uh, connect up other hardware interactions, your encoders, screens, LEDs, whatever. And there's many open source examples of these. So uh, Tom Whitwell uh, from Music Thing Modular and uh, Emily Gillet uh, from Mutable Instruments, they both open source everything. It's great, you can steal it all. And um, obviously, don't, if you're going to steal it completely, then you need to talk to them about it. But I mean, just stealing parts of it, um, it's just really useful. And you just kind of see, oh, that's what that is. And you just see these bits, essentially, of Lego that you're cobbling together. So I just want to talk quickly about, I realize I'm going through things quite quickly, but I'm just trying to give a very high-level overview. So audio codecs 
Uh, I did briefly mention before when I was talking about DAISY and Teensy, they're essentially uh, a, a DAC and an ADC in one IC package, but they are geared up to doing audio. So normally you would configure them with I2C, which is just a uh, serial digital protocol for setting them up, um, and you would squirt them data uh, as I2S. Most of this stuff is abstracted for you in hardware libraries, so you may never need to care about the intricacies of that, uh, but if, the more you get into it, it's just useful to know that that's what's happening under the hood. And the way they're normally set up is you'll have a, a hardware interrupt that will interrupt the, um, the microprocessor at a regular rate based on your um, sample rate and say, right, here's a block of audio and you've got, say, 256 samples. Uh, you'll take those samples, you'll process them, and then you'll spit them back out again. And that process has to happen quickly enough that you finish it before the next one comes along. Because otherwise, if you're, if you're overlapping, your audio interrupts are overlapping, then you're going to get glitching. So that's when you have to like, make sure things are fast enough. And that's when you have to think about things like uh, performance. This one here is a WM8731, but there's loads. Basically, it's whatever you can get your hands on nowadays. Um, hopefully, that will sort itself out eventually. But yeah, everything's hard to get at the moment, isn't it? So yeah, so I'm just going to talk about Eurorack. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Eurorack, but it's basically a type of synthesizer that you can spend thousands and thousands of pounds on. And I think when I heard about it, I was like, I'd like to get into that. But I know that if I start buying it, I won't stop. So I made myself a rule that I was only going to use things that I built myself, which now has become a bit of a problem in itself. But So the reason that I like Eurorack um, is probably not the same reason as other people like it. I, I sort of like it because from a building perspective, you just have to build a front panel, you've got your hardware underneath, you don't need to build an enclosure, you don't need to worry about power really because that's already in the case. The standards for the signals are all there for you so you can interact with uh, other modules. The dimensions are well known, and also it has a dual voltage power supply, so plus and minus 12 volts, which makes dealing with um, AC signals, like audio, much easier, because you don't have to do any offsetting and anything complicated with virtual grounds. Uh, it's all kind of there for you. Um, I don't tend to use a huge amount of CV in my projects, and I've had comments under my YouTube videos saying, why did you bother putting this, they're so angry, I'm not sure why, why did you bother putting this thing in, into Eurorack when you've got no CV? And I'm like, to me, they're just like guitar pedals that I'm just making in a more easy way. But um, yeah, they probably weren't that angry. But anyway, it's, you know, it, it, it's not really, the way I use it is not really probably how Eurorack is intended to be used, although I have started to use CV a bit more, and I'm starting to come around to why it might be useful. So, this is, um, I think building kits is a really great way of getting started. Um, this kit is the Music Thing um, Radio Music, which is the first kit I built, I think. Um, you can get that from Thonk, and it's Teensy based, and it plays back audio from an SD card. It's pretty easy to build, and it's a really good kind of learning experience because just from looking at it and turning it around and you go, okay, I see, that's where the teensy is. They've done some like double layered thing to make it smaller. That's the kind of, that's how they've stacked it up. And just looking at it and putting it together, you kind of work out how I could build this and change it a little bit. And I've also written my own firmware for it. So I, I have a few in my case that are running kind of bespoke firmware. So you... Once you've taken your idea and you've breadboarded it and you've written some code and you've got an effect working, but you don't necessarily want to take a breadboard out live because it's a little bit precarious, um, you want to make something a bit more solid that's going to last. Now, you can go down the Veriboard route and uh, solder to Veriboard and use one of those tools to, to break the tracks, and that's great, I've done that. But nowadays, making PCBs is so cheap that I kind of feel that it's just, it's just cheaper and easier just to, to get some made. So, You've got two main bits of software, which uh, I think the community is using. One of them is Eagle, one's KiCad. I started with Eagle, uh, I now use KiCad. They both have their foibles, I think. Um, there's a certain amount of Stockholm Syndrome, I think, from using them that you kind of, it's, uh, that you kind of can't get over. Um, but KiCad is being constantly developed and is totally free. Okay, so I've only got five minutes left. So, so here's... Um, that's a schematic, so that's when you've laid out all of your um, components in the tool. And then you can lay out the, the PCBs. So there are various tools um, 
for doing that and you'll be like laying down tracks and it feels a little bit like a kind of 80s puzzle game as you're trying not to go over the other tracks and it's kind of fun and you're placing your components where you want them on the board. Um, one, one tip, before you send anything off for manufacture, print it out, lay out the components on your board uh, because it saves you so much time if you, you find that your footprint's wrong or things are too close together, so make sure you do that. Um, the other thing is, once you know you make PCBs, you can use that exact technique to make uh, front panels. So you, the silk screen, which is the white, which is normally for text, the copper layer, which is for your tracks, and the solder mask, which is the green layer, depending on what color your PCBs are, they can just be colors for uh, um, a front panel. So here is a, on the left is a front panel in KiCad, and that's what it was like when it's cut out. So all that difficult drilling is done for you. I could never have cut that nice square out for the screen. So it's a really nice way of doing front panels. And there's some examples there um, of front panels that I've made. So I'm just going to quickly show you the glitch delay. So this is an effect um, it's based on the Teensy 3.5. It uh, uses a WM8731 codec I was talking about, and I'm just going to play this short video. So it's essentially, it takes audio into a buffer and um, has multiple read heads on that buffer at different pitches, and some are playing backwards, and you can just control and parameterize those, those, those looping read heads. So, so that, and, and I've got loads of videos on, on YouTube if you want to check them out afterwards, but just wanted to show you that to give you a rough idea of what it might sound like before I show you what it looks like. Um, and this is the board. Um, as you can see, I stole that idea off the radio music and making it multiple layered. Um, there's the Teensy on the back, uh, and there it is side view, so you can see it's like a, um, a two-layer board with a Teensy mounted on the back. Uh, that bit, uh, the top left is the power. So it's all those little circuits we looked at kind of just glued together. So that's it really, um, in terms of things you should read, if you're interested in this, you should absolutely read Handmade Electronic Music, The Art of Hardware Hacking by Nicholas Collins. It's uh, the book that got me started on all this really and it's just really, really great. It also goes into a lot of the kind of, um, the origins of sound art and yeah, it's great. Uh, Designing Audio Effect Plugins in C++ by Will Perkel. Um, I bought that recently, I'm enjoying it, so uh, it, it, it's good kind of DSP versus code. Uh, the dope for page for the construction details is useful. You should, uh, if you're learning KiCad, you should watch Sean Heimel's uh, introduction video on YouTube. I watched that, watched all of them, and then basically I could use KiCad. Uh, also, the Teensy uh, audio workshop is uh, really, really good. It's on YouTube. Um, and yeah, so if you just look on the Teensy site, you'll see that uh, that's well worth watching. So if I was gonna, if you ask me now, how should I start? I'd say get a Teensy 3.1, get an audio shield, get some breadboard, get a few components. You don't need many LEDs, potentiometers, switches, whatever. Get a multimeter. That's all you need. Just get those things and you're away. Now you can go and buy a cheap oscilloscope. I have a 20 pound Chinese oscilloscope and I'm still using it and it's fine for me. You can get a cheap signal generator, that's useful as well, but again, you don't need it. Those top things, you can get going. For small um, orders of things, eBay's great. AliExpress is like a Chinese website, you can get stuff direct. It's really good, but uh, you will have to wait several months for things sometimes, so uh, yeah, if you, if you know in ahead of time, then it's great, and it's cheap. Um, Farnell and RS and Rapid, are, uh, you know, your bog standard, you can get pretty much everything from those, and also Mouser and, and um, DigiKey. So just to wrap up very quickly, I'd say getting into building your hardware is really rewarding, really satisfying. You will get some awesome sounds that you didn't think about and that you end up using on every single track you ever write. Um, but it is a completely bottomless rabbit hole and you 
you get into it, you may never get out of it. So just sort of a little word of warning. Um, but if you've got a working knowledge or a willing list to learn programming, and you, you will be able to do it, you know, just, you just need to get started. So yeah, learn the building blocks, um, and then like, things like power and the audio, and borrow from open source projects. Just plug them together on breadboard, just try things. When you've got them going, just build something. Um, obviously, nowadays, everything's on YouTube, Twitter, forums. Just keep looking at all that stuff, because someone's probably tried that exact thing you're trying to do. The hardest thing is working out what it's called so you can ask the question. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be playing live at the... They tell me it's the main stage. I think it's the only stage. It's just being nice. Um, but it's on Sunday at 10 p.m. Uh, and, yeah, that's the, the gear I'm going to be using. Hopefully, it's all survived the, um, the journey. It was a very full car, so I haven't got it out yet. So let's hope that it all still works. But thank you very much indeed. Cheers.